What up, guys? So today's podcast is inspired by my aging body. <laughs> um, as I know of many of you guys experience, I recently, um, with my Chew Crew email list, I did a um, survey and I got thousands of surveys back from people. And I saw that a large number of people are roughly around the same age as me. And you guys are going through those same things, maybe even older. And there were actually surprisingly a lot of black belts um, that were on that list. And one of the, the things that was coming up with a lot of the higher belts who had a lot of training under their belt, and even from the new people, they're in jiu-jitsu and they're, you know, they're struggling with old man problems in jiu-jitsu. And um, in a lot of cases, it's things that they didn't experience when they were younger. And so today's podcast is going to be a set of old man tips. These are things that I'm implementing or I've implemented. They're things I'm working on currently as I'm approaching 40. Um, obviously, Eugene is, you're 40 now, aren't you? I am 40. Yeah. You are 40, right? So he's he's big four zero. Um, yep. And these are also tips that like I've seen older guys who have done it really well implement into their games as they've aged. Because again, it is one of these things where whether you're getting started in jiu-jitsu and you're a little older or you're older you know and you've been training for a long time and then you you have some things these things could be really useful to you so hopefully for you guys that are a little bit older these tips could be useful to you that said the tips that i'm going to share with you could be useful if implemented by younger people in certain things but what's going to happen a lot of times is that you just won't have to because you're younger yeah, you won't yeah. have to implement these things but yeah. they could still be useful to you because nonetheless, they're just sound fundamentals. They're nothing crazy. I'm not, I'm not going to give you some secret sauce that is going to like change whatever. I, it's just sound fundamentals in the way to approach training. And it just becomes ever more important as you get older. But there are a few things that are kind of unique to us as older guys as we uh, start to get into our 40s and 50s and so on. So there's one thing I've done. One, one change, one thing that I've implemented and focused on, I'll share uh that has been a, i think a game changer i've gotten multiple comments on the jiu-jitsu mats and from other people okay. um so i'm going to share that later but it, that's been it's been a game changer it's kind of like i don't know i want to say the fountain of youth but man it's made me feel better and younger for nice. sure and, cool. and better on the mat so so hopefully you guys enjoyed the podcast and get something from it um big thanks to our sponsors charlotte's web cbd you guys know that i i talk about them all the time. Um, I got asked from a, a viewer or listener said viewer listener about like sort of my favorite products that I use from Charlotte's webs. My favorite, like, I guess you'd say like my top three, if you will, I like the, the tincture. My favorite tincture is actually the orange blossom. It's basically CBD with like a little bit of orange taste to it. It's kind of tastes almost like fruity pebbles um, mm. when I'm taking the tincture. So that's the tincture I like as far as the gummies go. I like the recovery gummies. They come with some turmeric, um, and they have the CBD in them. They taste really good. They've got like a ginger taste to them. So they're, <laughs> they're kind of like fruit snacks in a way, like yeah, a little ginger fruit snack. Yep. And then the, um, the stick. So they make a, if you guys ever like see me traveling, I always have this, uh, they have a pain relief with CBD stick. Um, they've, they've got a couple different ones. It's the, it's the sport one, the active sport pain relief stick. That's the one that's got like a little burn to it. Um, but if like my back's hurting or something like that, I can put that, I'll have my wife put that on there and it comes in a stick. So it's not too, it's not like a, it's not too greasy. It's pretty yeah. easy to spread on. Just make sure that you wash your hands afterwards. Cause it, uh, it'll burn you. So those are my three favorite products from them. And if you guys want to check out any of their stuff or check those products out, you can go to their website at charlottesweb.com. Promo code is Chujitsu30, C H E W J I T S U 30 for 30% off the order. And Chewy, we have uh, a page on Charlotte's Web's website, and it's charlottesweb.com slash Chujitsu, where they can go in and actually see all your favorite products and all that stuff that you've got that we've talked okay. about. So you guys can go there as well. And then thanks to Matt at Epic Roll for supporting the podcast. Again, if you guys have never tried out any of his products or seen his stuff, I encourage you to go for a look, a little browse on his website. Treat it like going to the store if you were interested in buying some clothes and you just want to look through the aisles a little bit and see if there's anything that you might like. He has some really cool designs. He has great quality stuff. I really love his Nogi stuff. I wear his rash guard and his shorts all literally every, at this point, almost every training session. I roll except for one day a week, probably. I probably wear his uh, no gi gear, and it's the stuff that I like. It's what I get my gym stuff made out of. It's what I get my jujitsu stuff out of. And uh, the Velcro less shorts, the shorts with no Velcro are, are really comfortable and they work really well. I've had one of my pairs going on three years now. And again, I can't say that most of the shorts with all the Velcro straps, they typically go out sooner than that. So, again, if you guys want to check them out, 
He has a lot of different designs, cool stuff, great customer service. EpicRollBJJ.com. Check him out. Use promo code Jiu-Jitsu20 for 20% off the order. And if you guys want to support the podcast directly, you can do so by going to the website, patreon.com slash the Jiu Jitsu podcast. And you can join our Patreon for an inexpensive price. And on top of that, then we'll give you access to an exclusive library of content that we've prepared that has everything from interviews from all of our past guests, giving you tactical tips that you can implement into your Jiu Jitsu to um, different videos that we've produced, like rolling videos that have never been released. Um, stretching videos that Eugene's put in specifically for grapplers to help them out with certain tight areas of their body to seminars and things like that. And we have an ad free version of this podcast. If that's something that you'd be interested in, you can get that again at patreon.com slash the Jiu Jitsu podcast. And guys, as I mentioned before, this podcast came about because of a survey that I did with my Chew crew email list. Um, that's where basically that's probably one of the, if you ever want to get in touch with me, that's probably one of the best ways. Like I keep on a side tangent. I delete Instagram at night. And then I only, I reinstall it at around like three or four o'clock and I use it for a few hours and I just delete it back off um, it, because it, it, it's already logged you in. So it's very easy because again, you know, for me, we have to be careful about our inputs, just like you can have too much food and feel bloated and sluggish too much inputs. As far as information goes, this is going to be a problem. It's going to scatter your brain. It's not going to be helpful. And there's so much data to back up that like short form content is not helping out our attention span. Right. So I would rather spend my time focused on doing like listening to long form podcasts, reading books, uh, watching videos that are long form or lectures, things like that, things that I feel like are going to nourish me. And um, it's also why I don't post as much short form content on Instagram as much as I was because I don't want to contribute to it, but I still want to use it from time to time. And it's also a way to communicate with you guys, which is primarily what I use it for. But anyway, that said, if you do need to get to me somehow, usually email is the best way. And I send out a daily email at jujitsu.net slash join. When you go there, you can join up. I'll give you two free eBooks. You can join up to my email list and I'll send you a message um, each morning or each afternoon, depending on where you are in the world to receive it. And it'll just give you some idea to chew on maybe a book that I'm reading that I find useful, a training tip that I think might help you out. Um, and sometimes all the time I offer different uh, options for courses and series and events that I have going on, things that you might be interested in. Again, uh, that said, I don't spam anybody and you can unsubscribe at any time. Now, with that said, guys, let's jump into these old man, old woman, old people, jiu-jitsu tips. So the first one, and I think this is one, this is all the way, this is the way that I always think about stuff. It's a mental game first and foremost, right? We can talk about the physical and the physical is really important, but it always starts with the mental. Um, you know, I think about that, like there's that old uh, saying where that old analogy where, you know, they talk about the the elephant at the circus, right? Where when the elephant's young, they put this stake into the ground and it sort of ties the elephant up and they treat the elephant in probably not the most humane way, but essentially this elephant learns that when its leg is locked in, that it's trapped, and then what happens after a long time, the elephant gets big and strong and they can put that stake in the ground. And even though that elephant is so much stronger to just rip through it, it still stays in place. Right. And you can even see this with other animals and stuff like that, where they get treated in a certain way and they, they hold on to that mental, whatever that thing is. Right. And again, for us, there's an interesting thing that happens when we're doing athletics and stuff like this. This is especially important for people who have either done jiu-jitsu in the past when they were younger or have some athletic background when they were younger. Mm -hmm. We grow to like that person. We grow to like them. We like, oh man, I'm young, I'm strong, I'm doing this, whatever. We get attached to it. That is our ego. We're like, this is who I am. I now have this construction of who I think I am and this is who it is. And then what happens? We start to get older. We start to change a little bit. We don't recover as much and we get tired more. All these things happen. And a lot of times there's going to be some serious resistance to it. You know, and even when you were younger, you if you started, like when I was younger, I remember telling all the old guys, ah, you old guys are just old. I remember we were talking about it this morning. You know, back when I was younger, I would hear the old guys talk about being tired after a long days of work yeah. um, at like the 6.30 or whatever, seven o'clock class, right? And I would hear people say that, and you know, I'm 
24 at the time. And I'm just thinking, man, you guys are a bunch of old, old farts, right? No big deal. Now I'm older and I do work a lot more than I used to, but even then I'm just older. And when six, seven o'clock comes around, I'm a little more tired than I usually am, you know, yep. especially yep. when the days are getting shorter, like right now, I'm a little bit more sluggish. And so again, the first things first, before we can start to implement some of the actual tactical, physical tips that I will share with you in just a bit, you got to be okay with it. You got to be okay with this transition and you have to not resist it completely because I've seen friends of mine who, instead of adapting, because again, when I'm talking about old, old man, old person jujitsu, I still want you to be a badass, right? I still want you to go into the gym and win rounds. I still want you to go compete and win because I do those same things. But it's not a, it's not about just laying down and dying. It's about changing ourselves so we can roll forever. That's really what it's about and being very intelligent about that. And I've seen buddies of mine years ago, guys that were above me or a little ahead of me, and they did not honor this. And they kept, you know, burning the candle at both ends into their late 30s, 40s, and so forth. And their bodies are completely broken. They can't roll anymore. Um, they've had countless surgeries. I don't want that to happen to you guys. I don't want that to happen to me. So I'm making some adjustments. And I can feel that it's helping. And so I'd like to help you out with the same thing. So again, number one is we got to be okay with it first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there, um, I think for me, the, uh, the energy levels, like not having the same amount of energy, like the, the, the spunk, um, yep. not having that as consistently, is there an area for you that you felt like you had the hardest time adjusting to as you've gotten older? Yeah. My pace. So for instance, when I was younger, my pace, I, I could just keep up. I mean, you, you've, you were there. Yeah. Like I could, I mean, like for instance, and this, this was, wasn't until I was like 35 when I was uh, like, I remember like when I was 32, for instance, and I was, I felt like I was probably my physical peak. Yeah. I remember Is that being, when you did ADCC. How old were you and did ACC? 32. Or Trump. Yeah. 32. That was, was a like, hell of a performance, by the way, man. Six 30, matches. That was 32. Brutal. I felt, felt great. Well, when I, I think it was actually maybe my 31st birthday. Okay. My 31st birthday, I rolled with everyone in the gym and I submitted everyone and I did it in 75 minutes. I rolled straight with yeah. black belts, blue belts. I mean, whoever was there, I rolled with every single person that was on the mat that day. It took me 75 minutes and I submitted everyone. And I remember like Adam comes up and was like, man, that was amazing. And I was so out of it. I was exhausted. I don't think it was probably the safest thing in the world to do. And yeah. I, could, I couldn't do that now. There's no way I could do it. I think I probably have a heart attack. You know, I just, I, I just wouldn't be able to do it. You know what I mean? I just, uh, I mean, it'd just be too much. Yeah. Whereas back then I could do that. It was not a big deal. And so one of the things that I noticed is both my pace of the volume, the amount of volume that I put in training yeah. wise, yeah. that ha that's changed. And I have to dial that back a little bit, but even the pace that I put in when I'm rolling, like I'm used to almost like a rhythm, a cadence, if you will. If you think of a song, it's like I was playing at a pretty high beat per minute yeah. sort of song for a long time. And now I'm having to drop that beat down a little bit because my body can't keep up. And that was one of the things I noticed first on because I was like rolling and I just noticed that like I would have a scramble and it would be a scramble that normally would be very normal. And then I would get yep. on top and I would I'd be breathing heavily. I'm like, Whoa, why am I breathing so heavy? You know, yeah. I'm not used to this. You know, and that was one of those things where it became more and more intentional. And I'll talk about how I actually did this because it's very hard to actually regulate your rolling sometimes. I'll talk about how I did this in a second, but I had to regulate the rolling. Then that was my biggest one was pace. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And uh, that, that's the thing too. I'd go against people younger and I'd like I could match them. Yeah. And then I was like, then I was like, all right, I gotta slow them down. I gotta bring them to my pace instead of trying to keep it up, keep up with theirs. So there's a little bit of strategy involved there. But as you know, we get older, we also, if you've been in jujitsu for a while, you start to be able to utilize different tactics and techniques, which we'll kind of get into as well. Mm -hmm. That's kind of been part of it. Is like you got to use your instead of using your your physical being, I use your your mind a little bit more to uh elicit kind of to, to make the game go where you want it to go essentially and that gives you a better area for for success yeah and we'll get to that in a second because you're, yes. you're 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 getting ahead of it a little bit but we'll oh, get there yeah, in a second um so the, the the second tip that i would share with you guys and this kind of goes back to what i just said as far as regulating things is using nasal breathing as much as possible to moderate your pace yep. so for instance when you're training when you're doing exercise you can start breathing through your nose but eventually, once it gets down to you really pushing yourself, you're going to have to mouth breathe. 
you just simply can't offload the CO2 and fast enough to just do it through your nose, right? So as soon as you get moving really hard, you're yeah. going to start mouth breathing. So what that did was, is that helped me moderate my speed sometimes. So I'll give you a great example of this in action. There is a guy in the gym who's in his early thirties and he's, he's a bigger guy, right? He's about two thirty, and athletic, like, um, just super strong athletic. Um, his name's Emilio, very explosive. And when I would roll with him, sometimes I would get into these scramble fighting battles. And I always noticed that when I was done with that role, <sighs> I was exhausted, right? Mm -hmm. So what I started doing was I started, and again, I try to focus on my nasal breathing as much as possible when I'm rolling, right? I try to breathe through my, my nose as much as possible and then breathe through my mouth when I need to. But with him, I had to be in, very intentional because I didn't want to get into the speed scramble battle because that that's not a that's not a great idea for me being a little bit older, slowing down a little bit. So and also being smaller, like physically. So what I started doing was nasal breathing and staying very relaxed and basically not trying to go right after him and, and like head first, basically letting him move a little bit and almost like letting him wear himself down a little mm -hmm. bit while I was playing more of a defensive game and focus on keeping my nasal breathing going. Right. And if I felt like I had to mouth breathe because I was getting into like a really like fast moving position, I would settle down a little bit. So this way I could catch back up with just nasal breathing. Yep. And then when I was ready to go, then I could go. But the nasal breathing thing is really useful because it allows you to like, you can think of this like meditation. I, I used this idea in a, in a video recently. When we meditate, what is the idea? What is the goal of it? The goal isn't to just clear your head, right? That's that's what we're like aiming after, right? Like the idea that you can clear your mind to some degree. Mm -hmm. But if you've ever tried meditating, what happens? You sit down, you take a breath in, and you try to focus on the in, out of your breath. And you just try to focus on that sensation. And then for a moment, it's like your mind clears. And then what happens? A minute later, it's like a second later, it's going over to all kinds of random thoughts that you haven't thought about. And you don't know why they're popping in your head. The magic of the meditation is to then... Oh, I'm thinking, I notice it. You create distance from it and you say, let's get back to breathing. Let's clear the head again. And that, that, that action of constantly recognizing your thinking, getting back to this, and just that is the magic of it. Now, mm -hmm. where we use that with jujitsu is if you're focused on, you know, maintaining that nasal breathing, maintaining a certain pace, not trying to get into these firefights, you're going to have to have an intentional way of rolling. You're not going to be able to just go in there and just let it happen. You're going to have to be very intentional about it. And so your goal then, and this is why breathing can help that is to recognize, Oh, I'm getting into a scramble knockout drag out battle right now. And I'm starting to wear myself down. Let's back off the gas pedal a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's your job. And again, even if you're not trying to slow things down, maybe you're just noticing that, you know, maybe you're trying to work on something very specific. This happens a lot, right? What happens when you work on something that's new to your game? A lot of times it's not going to work in the beginning. Yeah. And then a lot of times the then urge is to just go back to using whatever's comfortable to you, your best stuff, your A game. Well, if you're trying to intentionally get better with something, we got to bring it back. And if you notice that all of a sudden your body starts to veer off and go back to whatever it's comfortable with, we then bring it back to say, no, no, no we're here today with intention and we're trying to be intentional with our rolling. We're not really worried about the intensity. We're not worried about just winning. We're worried about rolling with intention. And so nasal breathing to moderate your speed is very useful. It's something that I do a lot. It's useful to me as well. Yeah, great point. And also, I think with the meditation and practicing that, you're practicing awareness. So you're trying to bring awareness to your to what you're doing, you know, but kind of focusing on, on jujitsu and focusing on the role and the intensity. But you're sometimes, like you said, you can get kind of just so into the role that you kind of don't realize that you're like oh shit i'm I'm really worn out or i'm really starting to, to lose some energy here so i think the sooner that you realize that the sooner you have awareness or able to bring awareness to your breath and and kind of where the situation you're in obviously the the quicker you can kind of resolve that and start to you know get your game where you want it mm -hmm. yep. now let's on let's move on to an actual like technical tip here because i know you guys are like it's me older guys are listening say oh meditation and being okay mm -hmm. with it sounds like a bunch of nonsense whatever yeah it's good stuff but <laughs> let's get into the actual technical side of this thing so let's, let's talk about positional choice right so again if we understand that if we get into these scrambly battles and again as you go with older guys it's not nearly the same because like for instance if i roll with um some of the older black belts that are closer to my age we're both 
you know, playing with the same deck, right? It's when I go almost. with <laughs> almost, right? I mean, we're all we're, yeah. we're playing with a similar deck, right? Sure, yeah. It's when I go with guys that are like 22 years old and they have a college wrestling background or, you know, they're 23 and they just got done getting ready for an MMA fight. Those are the guys I'm talking about that give me the most trouble or even the 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 30-year-old guy that just he's an athletic freak. Those are the guys that give me the most yeah. trouble as far as that really make me recognize that I've got to play a different game. So with that said, when I'm up against those people, positional choice is very important. What positions are we going to use? Um, a great example was actually from this morning. So this morning I went into the gym and I'll be honest with you, I wasn't feeling it, right? A whole conversation could be made about that, but I wasn't feeling it. I felt kind of tired. I think uh, we had a really long lesson horse riding yesterday. And I think just the coach had us doing some really technical stuff with our legs. And I think it just wore me out like my nervous system a bit. I think I was just wiped out afterwards. And so this morning I'm training and I didn't have it. And I ended up rolling with our student, Brandon, the guy that was on the podcast uh, recently, who's a tough young guy. He's, you know, 24, 25 years old. And he he's an, he's a specimen athletically. And he's also a former wrestler. And he moves fast. He's yeah. tough to deal with. And he's technical in jiu-jitsu. So it's a pain in the butt on a, on a good day. And so I was like, okay, I've got to be very smart with like the way that I expend my energy in this morning when I rolled with them. And so for instance, I played a lot more full guard today. Mm. I'm not very good at full guard uh, and by good. I mean, I'm just in comparison to other guards that I play, but the problem is, is that, f or the benefit to full guard was it slowed him down a little bit. So yeah. we would have some sort of small scramble and then I would get back to full guard. I would lock him up and I would, take my breath. I, they would be my little rest, like my little rest space, right? I would take my breath in there. You guys have heard me talk about this. The two in one out, <sighs> take that breath. It's interesting that that was told to me back when I was a white belt. And then, you know, uh, I think it was Andrew Huberman. He, they talk about it. it's the physio physiological side, right? Too. <sighs> yeah. And it really, it helps bring everything down, catch my breath. And then I would try to go on the offensive again. Right. And then I would use certain positions like half guard or butterfly, those positions that I like to use uh, that I think are very useful. But if I had to, I'd lock them back up into full guard. Um, another example, too, position wise, is I'm having to retool my passing game a bit. So for a long time, my passing involved a lot of misdirection, moving side to side and all these sorts of things. And for a long time, I could do that just fine. Well, I notice that it takes a lot more out of me now. So now mm -hmm. what I'm doing is I'm retooling my half my passing so that I do have that option if I want it, but I also have the option to play a lot more tighter positions, a lot more chest to chest stuff, stuff where I can really grind people down and I sort of equate it to I'm at a jogging pace and I put them into a position of technical disadvantage so that this way they're simply they're at like they're fighting so difficult uh, so hard to get out of these spots that they're at like a, a running pace. So I'm jogging. My heart rate's staying really consist consistent, but they're having to exert, exert themselves just to try to fight back and they get tired. Um, and so, again, that's what I'm really working on with my passing, and it's getting a lot better. Um, at some point, I'm going to share more with that specific stuff with you guys in the future because I've been really enjoying it. Uh, it's made training a lot more enjoyable when I can play at, at a pace that I can play the entire the whole, the entire roles, right, the entire mm -hmm. day. Uh, but positional choice, you have to be mindful of what you're doing. And, again, this may require some retooling of your game, um, and you need to be conscious. Like, if you're new to this and you're older and you're looking at someone doing something – keep in mind what's going on, right? If you're watching some guy flip upside down and do some crazy scramble, that's probably not going to be your jam. But if you're watching someone who maybe has a similar body type to you or they're playing a slower game or whatever, that might be something worth looking into. And if you're older, that, but you've been training for a long time, you might have to let go of certain positions as you get older because they're just not going to be the best thing for you now, right? Uh, again, there's things like, even the way that you train, I mean, that's a whole nother thing, but um, using certain gi or no gi stuff, right? I have some students that don't train as much gi anymore because they said as they got older, it was pulling on their neck all the time with a collar, mm -hmm. right? And they just didn't like it as much. Even though they can hang on to grips, they didn't like it. Some of you guys might prefer the gi more because as you get older, you can hang on yeah. to grips. There's all kinds of ideas there. But again, you want to listen to your body and listen to how you feel during those, those roles and be intelligent with the positions you decide to use in order to, you know, use your jiu-jitsu. Yeah, I, I'm of the of the camp of like I think when I started, I did a lot more gi, and based on the way my schedule is, like I still, I mean, I probably get about 
75% of my training is gi and 25% yep. is no gi. I'd say probably the something like that, 60, 65, 30, something like that. And you just get a your body number one gets adjusted to the type of training you do. So if mm -hmm. you're more used to no gi, you're gonna probably find ways to utilize no gi uh for your, you know, being an older person. Um, yep. and then I just like, you know, I'm heavy with cross collar grips and, and collar grips and stuff, and it usually doesn't bother me too much. I think my body's just kind of used to that. Mm -hmm. I almost prefer the gi against someone like Brandon, who yeah, is yeah, just yeah. like he was just like a freaking cat that can just it, him. The more friction I have, the more like material I have to grab onto, the better for me. The more I can slow him down. In nogi, it probably be it would be tough. It would be tough for me. So that's something I've gotten used to. My body, I think, is used to that. But I think you should be able to obviously utilize positions gi and nogi for your game. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you were talking about, and you mentioned it consistently as you've been talking about this type of training you mentioned in class is uh when you're doing your slow heavy pressure grinding you're cooking people we're cooking yeah. them you're kind of putting them under this pressure cooker and you're making them basically start to panic or do something that they wouldn't typically do if they were fresh mm -hmm. or in a good position so you're making them uncomfortable by it. number one it's kind of like with that heavy pressure you can't take that big breath in as as you'd like to right mm -hmm. you make take a little smaller breath okay i'm gonna clamp down a little bit now this is the, how much breath you're gonna be able to get in then a little bit more and you you really kind of clamp down almost like you're putting a vice on them a little bit you're wearing them down and you're making them obviously tired and getting them to your level uh, or even more tired, and then you're going to make them make a mistake. And I think like um, it's it's really valuable. I think that's just a, a you know a a good strategy to have. Well, like think about a slow cooker. So like a lot of here's an example. When I doing this like slower passing, I was rolling with one of my brown belts once uh, just a few weeks ago, and he was telling me that you know the it was a six minute round rolling right. Just uh, it was at the open mat. And the first three minutes, literally, I'm just putting weight on him. I'm fighting for hand fighting and everything else. And I would almost have him pass and he would fight out of it and get me back into half guard. And we yeah. would keep going back and forth. The second half of that six minute round, that second three minute period, he was his arms were just done. He was like, I'm just cooked. And I remember he told me afterwards, he's like, I was just tired because I was you were just laying on me the whole time and putting pressure and I just didn't have anything else to fight with. And so you think about it as like a slow cooker. It's going to be a slower pass than say like some really fast cut throughs or whatever else like that. Yeah. Um, but think about what happens when we put something into a slow cooker, right? Takes a little long, longer to cook, right? It's not a fast. We're not frying something. We're slow cooking it. Yeah. But what happens to it? It gets the, the meat or the potatoes or whatever you got in there. They get soft just like anything else. Any, any other Breaks way down. you cook it, yeah. it's going to get soft. And so again, it's a slower burn. It's a slower style but it works out so much better. And I can do that for an entire, like I can roll like that for like an hour and a half um, and still get a lot of good technical work in opposed to if I was to go in there, just turning the burners up. And again, back in the day, I only had one speed. And for a long time, all of my hard training speeds were all fast. And so I've had to slow those down a little bit. Yeah. And, and, and to, to your point as well, you have bursts, right? You'll use those bursts as well. You'll mm -hmm. get those boom bursts. You might have that like, yep. You know, you're going to, you're going to put it, push the accelerator. You're going to accelerate into that position. And once you get there, boom, cook them again. Cause now you're out of vintage position. You're holding them there. And I think like, it's okay that, you know, the whole time keeping pressure is good, but when you find that opening, have the energy, have the reserves to be able to boom, you have that burst, get into position and then cook them some more. That's right. Another tip for you guys is the idea of a tactical retreat. So again, this is like, this is how my, my nerdy brain works, right? This is how things work. When you read a lot of like different military history, right? Sure. That's the stuff that I get into sometimes. There is this idea where, you know, sometimes if you were losing a battle, it's wise to back out before it gets too bad, right? Before you expend too much energy And the way that I think of like, you know, this is just like super nerdy, but the way that I think of like a lot of times, like if, if you want to draw the parallels to it is like, say your manpower of like, let's say if your arm, the army's manpower that you're fighting side against, well, that's our like cardio. And once that's used up, we don't have any, we don't have, we don't have anything left, right? You can have all the cool weapons and everything else, but you don't have the energy to expend anymore. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, sometimes to conserve manpower and to put yourself in a better position to fight the next day, an army might make a tactical retreat. It's a, re it's a retreat with intention. It's not a route, right? So for instance, like when you read about like in like ancient times, 
the rel- the like casualties were relatively low most of the time. The only time that things got really gnarly was when the people would just turn around and run away out of fear. And that's when like the cavalry would come in and they would just start swiping people up. But as long as they were orderly and intentional about the way they, you know, left the battlefield, most of the time the, the casualties were relatively low. Yeah. And so thinking about that idea of conserving your energy and not letting this whole thing go to shit, right? there will be times where you want to perform a tactical retreat. So what does that look like with techniques? So an example, again, we'll go back to this morning because, again, this was a great day to sort of talk about this whole thing because I'm rolling with a man who's almost 15 years my junior who is an athletic specimen who outweighs me by 30, 40 pounds. It's tough to deal with, right? Yeah. And a lot of you guys will relate to that, those young athletic guys. I get it. I hear you. I'm there with you too. Um, even as good as I am, there's still those athletic specimens who are very good and they're going to give you trouble, give me trouble. Yeah. So when we were rolling, I knew the game that he was trying to play. He's been wanting to do this standing passing where he starts going side to side, passing side to side. And bro, it will wear me out if I sit in a straight stance and sit there and try to play with them. Right. So what I did was, is I got onto my side. It's kind of hard to explain, but basically imagine that you're laying on your, on one hip with your hips facing the person at an angle. So instead of sitting straight, I'm sitting off at an angle, looking at him, one hand's out in front. And anytime he would try to walk to the other side of my hip, I would scoop back to make sure that he never actually had a chance. So basically what I was trying to do is I wanted to deny him the ability to pass to the right and force him to play to the left. Because I knew that eventually when he was going to come in, I wasn't going to be able to stop every guard pass. And I knew that if I could at least limit it to only him passing on my right side, I could I could work on an escape from there. And so during our rolling, we're going back and forth. I'm going for sweep attempts, everything else. And he's going for his passing attempts. Eventually, when I feel him passing, I say, okay, I'm losing this battle. And instead of fighting this with arm strength and everything else, and then eventually sort of giving way and going, oh. And then, then he gets into a really strong position that I'm in a really bad spot. I purposely was like, okay, I feel the passing. I put my underhook in and then got ready for the next battle when he got to side control. When he got to side control, I was already setting up an underhook escape and was able to wake, make my way out of it with a lot less effort, right? Another idea maybe to chew on is that in some cases, when you're in a mount position, the person will have their frame set up in a way that you can feel you're losing the position and you know they're about to like put their leg back into the half guard or whatever and you're going to lose mount. What I'll do sometimes is I'll put my foot into the quarter mount and I'll and I'll shift my base so that my knee becomes really heavy where they can't push that knee back into half guard. Mm-hmm. And so they intentionally will let me put the, they're like, oh, I get quarter mount, perfect. So they put mm-hmm. that leg into quarter mount, quarter guard. And then when I shift my weight though, now their frame is pushing against the leg and I can go for the cross face. And so now they've, I basically got a step ahead of them and I've made that tactical retreat. I said, you know what? I'm going to give you a little bit of position, but I'm going to do it with intention and I'm going to be ready for what's next. And again, these ideas will change on the position that you're in, but you want to think about sometimes where sometimes things are inevitably going to happen. There's not a way for you to really stop it. Right. So what can we do to put ourselves in a better spot? So if we have someone that, man, they're just moving all over the place and you know they're going to win this passing battle because you guys rolled yesterday and they were just all over the place. What can you do to set yourself up for an easy escape? Because again, a lot of times what will happen is is if they keep doing this, they're going to expend energy too. And if you don't fight them with the same amount of energy in some of these positions, you're not going to expend yourself down and you have more energy to fight when it's necessary. Right. We don't want to lose the we don't want to expend tons of energy and basically lose all of our gas tank in a position that we're not going to beat right now. Whereas if we can put ourselves in a good position, get back to a good spot where we actually have a chance of winning, then that's where we want to spend the bulk of our energy. And so this idea of of a tactical retreat has been really useful to me. It's maybe a little bit more uh, abstract. But if you think about it in that sense, thinking about like what positions can you give up or what things should you give up that you're expending a lot of energy in that can then allow you to have a better chance to fight, you know, afterwards. And to your point, and I actually harped on this a little bit in my class in a 6 a.m. class on Fridays, we get a good number of white belts in there. And I'm like, look, the time to fight 
the time to fight. If you're going to get past, you have to be ready. Like, you know, have your underhook yep. ready, have yep. your arm tight, have your elbows. So the time to fight or pass or scramble is during the transition, not when they have solidified position that they already got head control and arm yep. control and stuff like that. So, you know, be prepared. So if you know, all right, it's, I'm about to get past, have your arms apart position, have your hips in a good position, your body angled the right way that gives you the best chance of getting the underhook or, making a some type of scramble or some type of situation where you're not completely you know controlled with your shoulders to the mat so that's one thing like make yourself like ready to to attack or you know prevent that complete control from those you know that like somebody like big like brandon gets gets side control they have you know head and arm control it's over you can't let them have head and arm control you have to be mm -hmm. ready tight with that arm ready for your escape so and that same thing in mount too if you know they're coming into mount you can give them some things you have your arms ready your frame position ready, yeah. on the hips your frames exactly right um and if you get better at that and you know when to expend energy not like oh shit i got past you're like you take that breath you're like all right now i'm gonna fight time to fight is during that scramble that that position, that movement. Yeah, that's one of the problems like most people early on in jiu-jitsu have as far as their escapes go is, you know, they're at, they'll have like they'll come up to you, how do I escape side control in the person's chest to chest? They have both the arm and the neck. I mean, like that's a really tough position and it's You're possible. screwed, man. I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you might be able to make your way out of it, but it ain't going to be sure, easy. Sure. One of the things that you can do that will make your escape so much better is if you start thinking about them in the transition. So if yeah. you are losing that guard passing battle, or if you are losing the battle where they're transitioning to mount, we then want to move ourselves and make a tactical retreat into the next position and be ready for it. So that might say, okay, like, you know, if you're transitioning to mount and I can't stop it, then I want to try to get my frame set up. So as soon as you get to mount, I can already begin my escapes. Or if you're transitioning to side control, for me, I'm a, I use an underhook escape primarily as one of my best yeah. defenses or escapes. So as soon as you're like going into side control, I'm going underneath with an underhook and getting it ready. And again, there's some advantages to that, but that's the idea. You know, again, you want to be early on that stuff because that'll help yeah. you out. Now, the last one that we'll share with you guys today um, and again, this is probably going to be a duh one, but it's one of those ones where I talked to a lot of older guys. And this one is kind of like the, everybody wants this technical thing that they can do. They want to like, Hey, what's the technical silver bullet to like fix all my jujitsu problems. And keep in mind that jujitsu, there is a lot of technique. There is a lot of analytical thought that goes into all this stuff. But remember the bag of bones that you got sitting on this giant rock that we're on, right? that's what does jujitsu. And when that thing is running like a well-oiled machine, you will feel better. And if it's not, you're not going to be doing well. And so again, the last tip is going to be that the diet lifestyle that you live off the mat, that stuff becomes so much more important when you're older. I remember being younger, like many of you probably remember as well. And I could, I could literally stay up, drink three in the morning. I'm doing stuff, whatever. I actually remember this happening one day. I remember um, staying up late one night, going to the bars. I used to live uh, down by some bars. I didn't drink a lot, but you know, if a couple of the guys were going out for drinks, I'd go out. And so we we went out. And one of the guys, uh, <laughs> to t this is a fun story about me not drinking. They got me an Irish car bomb. Mm. Um, uh, what is it? That's uh, a <laughs> Jaeger, like, and it's like a half. Else? It's like a half pint of Guinness. And yeah. then it's Jameson and Bailey in a shot glass. Okay, okay. Right. And so you drop the you drop the shot glass in, and then you you know drink it real fast. Yeah. Well, so I I again this is my first time ever having one, and I don't really drink, so I didn't know. So I was pouring it in like real <laughs> like whatever, and the uh, the guys were laughing at me. They're like, "Bro, don't pour it. You just drop it in there." And so you know whatever I started we started doing those car bombs. So I did that. So I had like a bunch of car bombs at night. I go home, I wake up in the morning. I've got a hangover. One of the coaches couldn't make it. So my buddy calls me. He's Hey man, could you teach a class at noon? It's like, you know, 1030. Hell yeah, I've got it. Let's do it. I go in there and I have a great rolling session, roll for two hours. Feel amazing. Okay. If I did that today, I'm done. Like someone's calling me at like 1030. I'm, I'm yeah. saying, Hey, listen, I'm out for today. Right? Like it's not happening. Yep. And so many of us start to feel that the things that we used to do when we were younger with our diet, with our lifestyle, those things start to, uh, they start to creep back up on us now when we're older, they, uh, they take a little bit more out of us than they used to. And so again, I've, as I've become like one of the things that's really helped me out as far as my training, as I've moved into my like later thirties 
he said, I've gotten more detailed on my diet, more detailed on my sleep, more detailed on how I live, even like things that I used to de-stress. Like we all have a lot of stress from all the jobs and everything that we have. That stuff piles onto our body, right? That, that the stress is a big deal and finding ways to, to deal with that, to relieve the stress, everything else. And so a lot of that stuff is, is stuff that you have to be way more focused on when you get older, because when you're younger, you don't have to, you can get away with it. When you're, when you're older, you don't have the same level of recovery without it. Um, you know, you don't have the same level to just bounce back from a really bad night of drinking or whatever it is. So you have to be really intelligent with that, with your training. Uh, and that's something that's really like, I've been more detailed about all my lifestyle stuff, my diet and everything else in my thirties. I wish I would have done it when I was younger, but I did it in my thirties. And I think it's one of the reasons why I was able to have as much success as I had, you know, winning world, world, uh, you know, the world's winning Nogi pans, uh, placing at ECC, also growing a gym, being able to train a lot, do all these things in my thirties when, you know, again, I, uh, I don't think I would have been able to do it if I hadn't had those things in tune off the mats, um, as well. Yeah. I think we take a lot of things when we're younger for granted. You know, unfortunately, our body can compensate and adapt a lot better to certain things. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the piece that you know, before the podcast started, I was talking about, you know, the one thing, my little secret or not even really a secret because I've talked about it, is, is it's, like, strength it's just a little discovery for you. It's strength, conditioning, consistent, um, mindful, like specific strength conditioning that like the, the the reason why I came to my to my mind today was yesterday I was rolling with Hayden who's our purple belt he's like yep. 19 or 18 or 19 and he's like on the mats all the time and I always tell him like hey man you got you got to do other stuff too you know you can't just train all the time keep your body together but you know we were doing mount escapes and he's like man if you weren't if you weren't lifting so much you wouldn't get me off of you uh yeah, yeah. you know and I was just like a joke yeah he was he was but honestly like I mean I can move people easier for mm -hmm. sure and I feel stronger and I'm like, man, I wish I would have done that when I was 30 at 40. You're like, oh shit. Like I'm getting to be 40. This sucks. Well, I never took advantage of this. And and now, now like I've consistently been doing my strength and conditioning consistently, you know, and, and I your feel diet too. and my diet huge. You, I think huge. a diet, like your the strength conditioning is important, but too, man, you've also been eating really, really intentionally for the last right. several months. And like, yeah. you know, we were talking about it last night, your composition looks completely different. You know, yeah. you weigh about the same as you did when you started the diet, yep. but you did the cut and then you're working back up, but now you're way more muscular at the yep. same weight. And, um, yep. so I I'm think, stronger. I think that plays a huge role. It does. And like, you know, you got to think like, yeah, a lot of people love to go to the gym. Some people don't, but a lot of people love to go to the gym and lift weights. It feels good, but you also have to do the stuff that's not as fun. Sometimes not eating those snacks and doing things like that. And there's, I've, I've enjoyed learning how to say no to certain things too. Mm -hmm. Like certain, saying no to, I'll uh, say no to this ice cream or this cookie or whatever I've enjoyed. But also when I do take that, when I do eat a little ice cream, I indulge a little bit, man, I enjoy it so much more and mm -hmm. I've gotten more, more pleasure from it. So I think like, and man, who doesn't want to look a little better, be stronger, mm -hmm. have a little more muscle. And, and honestly, I feel like it's helped my jujitsu greatly because I've, I'm, I'm limited in how much I can train because I have a family and jobs, you know, podcasting. Yeah. I'm very limited in how much time I can utilize on the mat. So I have to get. I have to make progress in other areas. And mm -hmm. I think if you're someone that's getting in the late 30s or 40s, you probably have a family or obligations. You you, you probably aren't going to be that, you know, full-time grappler unless you're a coach and you kind of uh, own a gym or you really are a big part of this gym where you, you're you there all the time. You can get those rounds in consistently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to make progress elsewhere. But you also, if you are a coach that is in the gym all the time, you got to know when to kind of back off and say, today, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to push it too hard. I'm going to give myself a little bit of a recovery. I'm going to coach more. I'm going to be a little bit more observant, maybe get some rounds in, but they're going to be lighter. You have to be smart. That's one thing you did that you started doing in your 30s early 30s that made you much less prone to injury mm. much better performer like you know with i mean look at adcc trials we talked about you got third i mean fantastic you had six matches you killed it you know you were healthy consistently going into that and if you would have had you know all these you know wear and tear and all these little you know injuries you mm -hmm. probably wouldn't be able to get that amount of peak performance you know at that time yeah. And it's the, it's the, it's even the same thing. Like I, I was telling someone when I won worlds last year, like 
I was training like Nogi Worlds, by the way, guys. Yeah. Um, I was tra- like, I was only rolling probably three days a week hard. And the rest of the week was like strength conditioning, a little extra cardio drilling, you yeah. know? And again, in three days a week doesn't sound like a much, but that's what I had. And it's like, that's what I could do consistently. Yeah. Right. Like that's what I could do without break, having to take breaks. Cause I noticed whenever I try to push it too much, I'd either get injured or I'd get sick. And yes. so I'm like, okay, I got to back off. You know, I just, my body's telling me, Hey man, chill out, Chewy. We got to relax. Sure. Um, you know, but again, that stuff's really important. And, and here's one of the things I thought, um, I thought this was interesting. So I was listening to that Lex Friedman podcast with Jeff Bezos. Okay. I haven't, I haven't, I saw that he was on, but I haven't seen it. I yeah. I want to hear, I uh, hear it. Right. And um, there was something, there was something interesting that he said that I'm like, this is what I do. So a lot of times when we get into these situations or these activities that require like daily or really consistent habits and they have like really long-term goals that can be very useful for us right how do you make the short term because really humans aren't we're not really wired to chase long-term goals we're wired for like short term like immediate yeah. stuff we're, uh, yeah. we're wired for immediate gratification that's why like short form content or anything that has immediate gratification is so like gambling that's why it's so much fun for us because that's how we're designed it's like food why is it that we like potato chips and cupcakes and all these different things? Because it's just loaded with frigging calories. So it short, it short circuits our brain because these foods don't exist in nature, right? <laughs> so like there's nothing in nature other than milk that has a high amount of fat. And high, as far as I know, high amount of fat, high amount of sugars, right? If you go like high amount of fat, like say an avocado, tons of fat, no sugar, yes. right? No carbs. And then if you go into all carbs, oats, barley, um, fruits, Lots of sugar or lots of carbohydrates, different fruit sugars, things like that. No car, uh, no fats. Right. So there's nothing that has these things. So it short circuits our brain. It's literally just this calorie bomb, and our body is wired for it. Like, hey, it's it's trying to get calories because it doesn't understand. It hasn't evolved to understand that. Hey, there's a supermarket down the street, and that in most countries these days, food is in abundance. So we're wired a certain way. And so if you understand that, then you have to find some short-term thing that allows you to do these long-term goals, right? Like eating consistently for six months to change your composition. So for me, it always comes down to how I feel, right? So for instance, this morning, I was tired, bro. I didn't want to do it. I was exhausted. But I knew I wasn't like like tired to the point where I couldn't do something. Sure. Um, or like when I go to lift in the morning, sometimes I'm a little tired, but I do it anyway. Yeah. And then yeah. even like the reason why it's really easy for me to say no to things like ice cream and stuff these days is because I feel amazing after I'm done training. I feel great after I'm done training. Like when I get done working out, I feel great. Sure. And I love that feeling. And then when I eat bad food, I don't feel good. Like if I, if I was to go eat like you know, some sugary, whatever stuff, I would get lethar- lethargic and sluggish. So it's yeah. really, it's not even that attractive to me. It's like, ugh, I don't even want this anymore. It's right. gross. Like, it, because I associate it with how I'm going to feel afterwards, not with how I'm going to feel right now, because right now it's going to be great. It's how I'm going to feel afterwards, right? Maybe on a slightly like, um, slight kind of weird tangent, right? Like, it's one of those things where, you know, I've had women like make a pass at me, As I've been like, you know, with my wife, right? You know, nothing great, just like making a pass, like, hey, like, whatever. And, you know, there's a slight urge as a guy, we're like, ooh, she likes me, whatever. And then, but then I immediately think, what if, what if this thing did go like in, it became something you would ruin your life? And then you like think about your wife crying or whatever. Oh, this is terrible. Like, this would literally ruin my life, right? So instantly, I don't want anything to do. It's like, oh, get away from me. You're icky. So when I look at these, like when I look at these desserts, I'm like, if I eat this cupcake right now, the rest of my day is shot. I'm going to be so lethargic, so sluggish. Get away from me. Give me my, you know, my oats and my eggs. Give me my chicken and broccoli because yep. I'll eat this and I can go work out later and I'm going to feel like a champ. So um, when you guys are doing these different things, focus on, especially with the lifestyle stuff, focus on the feelings that you're going to get that immediate after effect of how good you feel during a training session, how good you feel after the workouts over, or how good you feel eating the right foods and how much better that feels. And if you've never done it before, if you've never had a good clean diet for a while, I encourage you to do it. Um, I encourage you to get a coach for help do it because what will happen is, is when you have contrast 
of how you feel versus how you feel now, like how you feel after you get on a diet, yeah. after you get your sleep together, all these things, it changes your life. And even going back to sleep, I got really detailed on a sleep routine these last couple of years to really dial my sleep in. And again, I, I know what the feeling's like to go through like a sleepless night. And I know what the feeling's like to have a great eight hours of sleep. Yep. So like for me, like there's, it's a no brainer. Like it starts to get nighttime. The lights go to the lamps. I dim them. I start reading a book. I start winding down because I know I have to do this because this will give me amazing sleep tonight. And if I don't do these things, if I keep going like really windy and uh, not windy, but I get myself all wound up doing stuff again, then what's going to happen is when I try to go to sleep at around midnight, which is my sleep time right now, then I'm going to not go to sleep. I'm going to end up, you know, being wide awake for another two, three hours. And I'm going to go to sleep, get maybe five or six hours of sleep. And I'm going to feel like garbage. And yep. so again, just an idea guys on that. So you can think about focusing on the positive effect of doing the good habit right now. And again, there are long-term benefits, but we need that. We as humans, we need the right now. And that's the right now that I focus on. That's been really helpful to me. So hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. If you're a little older, then appreciate you being here. Hopefully some of that stuck with you. Um, I'll keep doing some stuff on this. This will be like an ongoing series because yeah. as I'm going through things, I'm keeping track of it because one of the, the questions that I often get from YouTube videos and everything else is from older people in jiu-jitsu that just are trying to be able to cope with everything and you know be a little bit older. And so as I'm going through it, I'm going to share with you guys and let you know how things are going and let you know what's working for me. So hopefully it'll be useful to you. And so hopefully some of these tips are useful to you. This is the kind of stuff that I'm working on that's been really useful to me just as of late. And uh, I hope that it serves your jiu-jitsu very well. Uh, again, big thanks to our sponsor, Charlotte's Web. Again, if you guys listened to the beginning of it, if you didn't, then this will be new to you. If you did, then it's a review. But Basically, I got asked from a viewer what my three top Charlotte's Web's products are. They're like, what's they basically just asked me, Chewy, what are like your top three things that you like from them? Because they were going to use our code to, to get it. So my top three things that I like from Charlotte's Web is they have a tincture, which is like the eyedropper, the orange burst or orange blossom. It's kind of like a it almost tastes like fruity pebbles to me. Mm -hmm. And then the CBD gummies, the recovery gummies that come with turmeric and they have CBD in them. I like those. It's like a little ginger like fruit chew it's delicious yeah, it's, good. <laughs> it's 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 really good so i like those those are really good and then the uh, the last one would be the active sports uh stick so like when i travel or if i'm at home and i'm just sore somewhere um maybe I, like i got caught in a guillotine or something like that i can rub that on my neck it's very easy and it doesn't get very greasy um just make sure that if you do rub your hands wash them afterwards because yeah um you know it gets pretty it'll it'll get pretty 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 burny and uh, there was one time where I had used the stick, rubbed the ball in, and you know, grabbed a different part of my body and didn't wash my hands and uh, lit me up a little bit. There you go. In a place that I want to be lit up in. Um, not in that way, at least. So not in that way, right? <laughs> <laughs> not in that way at all. It, it was burning. We actually years ago we did that to a kid on the uh, on the football team. We put a we put uh, like a icy hot, icy hot, yeah, put yeah. in a jock strap, yep. and then uh, that was a. Uh, that was interesting, you know, because at experience. first it, at first didn't feel anything. And then as he started to warm up, it started cooking. <laughs> <laughs> He's out there in the field like, oh, God. So, yeah. so anyway, uh, young young boys are terrible. Yeah, that's right. But again, his you guys balls check, was hot, by the way. His balls were <laughs> hot. If you guys want to check out any Charles Whips products like the three I just mentioned or any of the other stuff they have, go to their website, charlesweb.com. You can do it one of two ways. You can do charlesweb.com slash jujitsu or charlesweb.com. And then when you go to the checkout code, simply just put in jujitsu 30 and you'll save 30% on your order. It's a great deal on their CBD products. And again, they make terrific products that are third party tested. And uh, again, that's really important when you're talking about a product that's unregulated by the FDA and being sold. Also, thanks to buddy, our buddy Matt at Epic Roll. Epic Roll is a jujitsu company made by a jujitsu black belt for jujitsu practitioners guy that actually rolls and trains just like us. And again, he makes terrific stuff, great products, great designs, and good customer service. If you want to, if you've never been on his website, or if you haven't been in a while, go to epicrollbjj.com and just look through some of this stuff. He's got some really cool t-shirts, t-shirts that I like wearing around that I find very comfortable and I like the designs. Uh, they have a, They have a certain level of like, you can wear them out and they're fine, but they're also mm -hmm. like still like if a jiu-jitsu person sees you, you guys are going to be on the inside and have like a little inside joke going on or you'll there's language to it that, that we would understand that say the 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 people that don't do jiu-jitsu don't. 
the people that aren't a part of our grappling cult they won't yeah, understand that's right um <laughs> speaking of grappling cult when we were at uh, uh origin um for the camp for the, they had a big group picture on one of the yeah. days and they said hey guys we want everybody to wear the white origin gi that we included um with your with your package because for sure. for coming to the camp they gave us a white gi and uh me and i forgot who it was me and a guy were just laughing because basically there was a i mean from all sides where you could look there was uh there was this big like uh gymnasium area that we were going into and from all foreseeable angles there's just like dudes and women walking in wearing white robes coming in right. like <laughs> and, and we were both laughing he goes and people say that we're not in a cult <laughs> but it's cult, man but anyway, Sometimes. if you guys if you guys want to check out some of Matt's products, yes, he, he really does have good stuff. I get all of my rash guards and shorts and nogi stuff made through him. And if you guys want to check him out, epicrollbjj.com. Promo code is chujitsu20, C-H-E-W-J-I-T-S-U-2-0 for 20% off. And if you guys want to support the podcast and get access to an exclusive library of content that we put together that has tactical tips from all the black belt guests that we've had on the podcast, plus the doctors and everything else that we've had on this and the coaches and things like that, that we've had on the podcast, along with an ad free version of the podcast stretches for jujitsu practitioners made by Dr. Eugene, the person that's talking on the podcast seminars for me, different rolling videos that I'm in, all this stuff that's not released anywhere else, you can get access to it at our Patreon, patreon.com slash the Jiu-Jitsu podcast. And upon joining that, you'll be supporting the podcast. You'll get an ad-free version of the podcast and you guys can go from there. And last but not least, guys, if you want to join my Chew Crew email list to get my daily email that goes into everything from books I'm reading to training tips that I think are useful to me that I share with you guys and everything in between, just anything that I think is useful or uh, entertaining, I share it through there. And again, that's at jujitsu.net slash join, J-O-I-N. When you join, I'll send you a couple of free eBooks as a gift. One is on designing your own game plan. One is on basically adjusting your training. So this way you're not getting stuck in a plateau where you're not getting any better. And then along with that, You'll get my daily email. I will not spam you and you can unsubscribe at any time. And so guys, with that said, I think we're done. I think we're done here. I think you got some good stuff to, to work on. My encouragement to you is that if you guys are listening to this podcast and one idea sparked from you, right? Like one idea popped up or one idea was useful to you, or maybe even me talking about something got you to think about something in a different way. And you're like, maybe I could try this out. My encouragement is to you is to do it right. Like, Again, this is something we're doing and uh, that I'm working on right now is we have a, uh, I have like a small little group. We're going to be doing like a little uh, implementation camp uh, mm -hmm. for our training. And one of the things, guys, is I talk about this all the time. One idea, like one idea that you that you like execute on decisively is worth a million that you just sort of collect, right? It's the difference between an executor and a collector. And my encouragement to you as we move into 2024 is to work on being an executor. This means take in less and what you get, you use it more. That's the focus. And again, that, that can make a big, massive change. That's the stuff that I think is really important. And that's, uh, that's again, as I was talking at the beginning of the podcast, this is one of the reasons why I take Instagram off my phone. I delete it um, every single day at a certain point, basically at nighttime. I want to hang out with my wife. I don't want to be distracted. And Instagram is where I burn my time. You know, we're all mm -hmm. a little different. You could be Twitter or something, you know, um, or maybe you spend too much time on YouTube. I don't know. We're all different. But basically, yep. I just delete that up off. And then when I need it, because I work on it and I like to go through my meshes, messages and I like to scroll around on there and look at like cat videos and all that other silly oh, stuff yeah, that's on there. Awesome. I give myself some time to do that, but I do it intentionally. I install it back on the phone. It takes like two minutes. And then once I'm done, I just delete it off. No problem. And so again, this limits my input to some degree and allows me to be a bit more focused on what I'm doing. And so I encourage you guys to do stuff like that. Manage your inputs. And again, manage your inputs and be focused more on your outputs. So anyway, guys, that's the idea. Hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. We'll talk to you next time.